touch the lid to you all so we have already completed the ancient history uh, now we are going to be studying the medieval history and from the medieval history we are going to be studying the second chapter that is called the bhakti and the sufi traditions so the first week is a mosaic of the religious belief and the practice so in the previous part we have learned about the different religions right we have learned about the hinduisms buddhisms and the jainisms and along with that we also learn about their philosophy their ideas and their rules and regulations and as well as their practice also so, so the question is that the how we could able to know about this religion's practice and their belief so through the different textbook we could know about their religions right so in case in the hinduisms we could know through the textbooks such as manusmriti vedas and as well as uh, purans so through these text we could know about the hinduisms and in case in the buddhisms uh, we could know through the tripitakas and the jatakas so these are the different texts right and we have also learned about that the, how the brahmans they have made the indian society into very complex manner and it is the lower class people they are suffering and suffocating into their daily life so that's why now the many of the local religions they started to growing up and the, uh, during that times the many of the new religious leaders they started to growing up and the many of the new religious leader they go place to place and giving a speeches to the peoples and they have attracted many of the disciples and their devotees and the many of the disciples they started to writing down the all the speeches and the compositions of their uh, saint and uh, many often time all these compositions were converted into the music also but the sometimes what the disciples they do is that the occasion is they just modify the speeches of the religious leader and sometimes they just ignore the speech of the uh, that specific saint right so that's why uh, the historians when they try to uh, uh, try to learn try to study about that religions they face a uh, problems so that's why the historian they study the hagiography what do you mean by hagiography hagiography is a biography of the saint or the religious leader so when the historians they try to study the hagiography they found the some informations about that uh, religious leader but the uh, in that hagiography also uh, there may be some in inaccurate informations also but the overall the hagiography can give us some a uh, glimpse of it now during the first mid century people started to worshiping a different kind of the god and the goddess such as the people started to worshiping a uh, vishnu shiva and the goddess so this is are, are the uh, the changes or the transformations into the hindu religions so the next topic is the integrations of the cults as i mentioned before that uh, due to the orthodoxy rules of the brahmans many of the local peoples and the lower lower class peoples they are suffering that's why now the local peoples they started to worshiping their own god so due to that many of the brahmans they are afraid of it because they thought that the, their religion might going to be extinct so that's why they wanted to integrate all these local religions into their own religions right so uh, they started to work upon it so there were the two work of the process for the integration so we are going to be learning on it right so the first first one is that the brahmans they wanted to start to compiling composing and the preservations of the all puranic texts into simple sanskrit language so in the very early times all the religious texts were into the very hard sanskrit so that only brahmans they could able to learn but the later on now the brahmans what they have done is that they are converting all these uh, religious texts into very simple sanskrit language so that everybody every peoples could able to learn it but the still here also the women 
and the shudra were not allowed to learn it right so the another uh, another second step was that the brahmans they started to rework open it and also they started accepting the all the local traditions there are the many of the local religions so they wanted to convert it into their own religions such as uh, the deity of the local tribe were recognized as the vishnu so the many of the goddess were identified as the wife of the male deities sometimes uh, they just uh, recognize the many of the uh, women god as a lakshmi shwa uh, who is a wife of the vishnu and sometimes uh, they recognize uh, the women goddess as a parvati who is a wife of the shiva so this is the example that the, how the brahmans they wanted to integrate all the local god and goddess into their own stream and here i have also shown you uh, some picture that the how the jagannath deities were recognized as the form of the vishnus so this is it the third topic is the differences and the conflict so as we learned before that the many of the local religions they started to growing up and along with that there's another religion which was coming into shape uh, it is known as the tantric and they just uh, just ignore the differences on the basis of caste systems and they doesn't give importance whether uh, the human was a male or female they just accepted the all kind of the peoples into their religions and they worship the vishnu and uh, represented shiva as a very supreme god instead of just uh, worshiping to the agni soma and indra which was a uh, worshiping to the nature god ra and the tantric religions they just uh, condemn the vedic traditions uh, which means that the, during the very early period uh, in the vedic tradition the many of the people they just uh, sacrifice the animals and they offer to the god they just uh, doesn't accept all these things they just condemn all these practices right so these are the actually the differences uh, and the conflict between the uh, tantric religions and the very existence religions right so and the tantric practice they frequently ignored the authority of the veda they never accepted the veda also so sometimes uh, this religions that the tantric religions uh, they just have a little bit conflict between the buddhisms and the jainisms also there's a uh, some tensions within them because uh, they doesn't accept the uh, buddhism ideologies and the jainisms idea also so these are the conflict so during that period many of the new religion was started to growing up and among from them uh, one of the most popular religion was the bhakti so we are going to be studying about the bhakti uh, so within the bhakti there are having a two different category the first one is a sanguna and the another one is the nirguna so in the sanguna the worshipers or the devotees they just worship the deities which are having a some uh, attribute or uh, the god which was having a some uh, shape or some form so such as uh, uh, the shiva was represented into the some sculptures and the vishnu also was uh, represented into the some sculptures so they are actually worshiping these god whereas on the other hand there is a nirgunas then uh, the worshiper or the nirgunas Uh, they doesn't have a god which was having a some form or a shape they just worship into the abstract god so these are the two different uh, category of the bhakti so the question is that the who have started the bhakti movement so the earliest bhakti movement was led by the alvars and the nayanars who are the alvars alvars are the worshipers of the vishnu and the nayanars are the worshipper of the shiva they just travel from place to place by a singing of the religious songs to pray a god and the, all this religious uh, song were uh, sing, sing into the tamil languages and they just go place to place and when they find the, some shrines they just uh, chosen it as a boat and uh, around them they started the building of the temples and the later on the temples become a very sacred place 
So this is how actually the Alvars and Nayanas they just go to place to place to spreading the Bhakti movement. So many of the historians they believe that the Alvars and the Nayanas they never accepted the caste systems and they just protest against the dominance of the Brahmins into the society. Because the many of the devotees of the Alvars and the Nayanas are from the diverse people such as they are from the untouchabilities also, they are from the low caste people such as the, uh, the artisans, the cultivators. These category of peoples are attracted by the Alvars and the Nayanars. So they also never accepted the authority of the Vedas. They never gave importance to the Veda also. And uh, uh, they are having their own text. The Veda, you can say that it was known as the Divya Prabandham. And they, they were uh, also frequently described as a Tamil Veda. And the most striking feature was that the, there was also presence of the women in Anwars and the Nayanars. For example, there was a woman called Andal, who is a worshipper of the Alvars, and she had composed a song which was sung by the, all the Alvars devotees, and she was a beloved of the Vishnu. And there's another woman called Akarakal Amariyar, and she was a worshipper of the Nayana traditions, and she also composed uh, some of the text where she have challenged the patriarchal norms which means that the, she have challenged the male dominations into the society so you can see that the, uh, there are some women also present into the uh, bhakti religions so this is how the uh, bhakti was attracted by the many of the peoples because uh, they allow even the women also to enter into their religions so during the second half of the first millennium centuries, the Buddhism and the Jainism, they had spread into the southern part of the India because they got a support from the merchants and the artisan communities and as well as they got a support from the Pallavas and the Pandyas because they are getting a lot of the royal patronage and uh, there are some oppositions or you can say the jealous from the Bhakti because they are always having a competition between the different religions uh, on the basis of the royal patronage because if certain religions they spread very widely then the, of course the uh, the empire they will be uh, giving a high patronage or the uh, high amount of the money to the, that specific religion so that's why uh, for the royal patronage there is always having a competition between the different religions so, uh, during the uh, 9th to the 13th century, historian found, found that the Chola empires, Chola rulers, they gave a high number of the amount or the patronage uh, to the Bhakti and the Brahminical traditions. By just uh, making a land grants, they just gave a land grants and as well as uh, they construct the temples for the Vishnu and the Shiva also. Such as uh, during that period, there was a magnificent uh, Shiva temples was built up by the Chola Empire, uh, such as Chidambarams, Thanjavur, and uh, Gangai Konda Cholapurams. These are the temples which was constructed by the Chola rulers during that period. And the ruler also wanted to support from the, these religions because uh, they wanted to show their uh, power and the status by the building a very uh, good temples with the stone and the metal. And these king, they also started to, uh, singing the religious song. And later on, these all the religious songs that was uh, just organized them into the text, which was called as the uh, Devaram.